Hello from clinic. I thought before I started um, to see patients today, I would give you a little brief um, clinical update for the physios and for any patients. If you're interested in bladder pain syndrome, um, then this is the place to be. So I've got a couple of papers um, of stuff I don't understand, which is the best way to learn. Um, one is by Parker. And I'll put the references down below here. If you're watching on YouTube, you need to head to my website to get the blog beneath it to look at the references. Um, Parker 2016, talking about urinary metabolites um, and uh, whether they correlate with risk and stuff like that in bladder pain syndrome. Um, it's one of the MAP Research Network, which is the multidisciplinary assessment of pelvic pain and um, uh, bladder pain syndrome, um, which is a huge network of like 250 researchers all over the world. Um, working on trying to discover what's going on and how to cure it or at least treat it effectively. So they took some samples, they identified using mass spectrometry, um, they identified stuff in urine, gets as technical as that with me because um, this is not what I do for a living and I like to go outside my fields to try and understand because then we can really, there's no way that you're ever going to understand everything about something but the best way is to try and pull the bits of knowledge from as many different areas as you can so this is me sharing. Um, so they did mass spectrometry um, on urine of patients with bladder pain syndrome and those without and they identified that something they're calling etio-s, so etio-s which is Dum, dum, dum. Where was it? Um, I did have it written down somewhere. It's got a really long name, but it's basically a sulfo conjugated five something reduced isomer of testosterone. Okay, so hormone derivative something. They found that the presence of this um, compound distinguished whether a female had bladder pain syndrome or not um, between the, the females with BPS and the controls um, with a sensitivity and a specificity of more than 90%. That's brilliant. So that's almost getting to the point where we have a test for bladder pain syndrome, being able to urine um, test. But I would point out it's mass spectrometry, so it's probably a very difficult thing to do and probably quite expensive and not many places have these machines. So the same way that we can now test for um, bladder pain syndrome using MRI scans that show activity within our supplementary motor area one and limbic system and lots of other different colouring within our brain and show that your brain works differently when you've got bladder pain syndrome in response to the chronic threat that you feel under. Um, we now know that um, we can also test your urine and maybe find the presence, if you're a female, the presence of this etios or lack of. I don't really understand which way it goes. I'm pretty sure it's the presence of. Um, so they talk about this being potentially a phenotype that those with high symptoms um, could, yeah, so among ICBPS patients, urinary etios levels are correlated with elevated symptom scores of symptoms, pelvic pain, and number of painful body sites, we'll come back to that. And they could res um, resolve high low high from low symptom subgroups. So we have another way potentially of phenotyping those with either a lot of SEOS that have really, really significant symptoms. Um, that little thing they said, symptoms, pelvic pain, and number of painful body sites. That's really interesting. Because we know that we have a phenotype potentially already, which is pain within the bladder, pain outside the bladder. And those with pain outside the bladder have, do much worse. Um, in general, in their recovery, it, it potentially um, shows that the, the body is fighting a greater threat. It doesn't mean that they're, they're done for. There's lots that can be done. And certainly in my experience, I would find that um, most patients have other stuff going on. And we work with those things and we get them back to function and it's great. Um, so there is hope. There's definitely hope. There's always hope. But um, we know that patients with just pain within the bladder, it's quite straightforward um, as an approach of stuff that we can do. Um, and again, this is another study backing that up, and that work originally was Jason Kutcher's a couple of years ago, his team, I don't know where he is, um, but looking at pain within, pain without, and Nickel and Tripp as well, they've done some work on pain within, pain, pain without the bladder. But I found that was interesting, so there's potentially an underlying biomechanical abnormality to do with bladder pain syndrome. And another 
metabolic one, histopathology of um, characteristics of BPS. Um, and they were looking at Hannah's ulcers or Hannah's lesions, not glomerulations, but Hannah's lesions um, and not Hannah's lesions. So this one is Kim et al. 2017, last year. First, yeah, first published June last year. What they did is they took 15 patients with non Hunter's ulcers, type bladder pain syndrome. So on um, cystoscopy, they have a look at the bladder, they don't see these little lesions. Then they took samples of the back wall of 15 patients with Hunter's lesions. So they see these little lesions. And then they took 15 samples from people with no issues whatsoever. Just they've got happy bladders. What we're all after, a good, happy bladder. And what they found was very interesting. So patients with non hunna without the lesions have more but ha that have interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome bps let's please all call it bps bladder pain syndrome they have greater fibrosis and mast cell proliferation or infiltration fibrosis being a bit like stenosis or really fibrotic and grotty like difficult to stretch than people without people with Hunter's lesions or without any bladder pain at all. People with Hunter's lesions and bladder pain syndrome symptoms have greater inflammation in general within their bladder lining than those with non hunner lesions and non interstitial cystitis and it was significant. So basically we know that if you've got moderate to severe symptoms and you don't have Hunter's lesions, you're more likely to have a fibrotic small capacity bladder. You have to go to the toilet a bit more often. Um, frequency, urgency, a bit more significant, reduced bladder capacity. And if you've got Hunter's lesions, you're more likely, if you've got moderate and severe symptoms alongside this, to have inflammatory issues, which again is another potential phenotype. Phenotyping is really important. Phenotyping lets us ask the question, um, what is your specific disease like? What is your specific experience of your disease or your pathology? How does that relate to what we know already um, about people that are just like you? So if they are just like you, you know, they're also 47 with a hysterectomy with blah, 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 and this kind of pain. Or how do we know that we can best treat you based on all the evidence. So we've got another type of potential phenotype because we're always trying to find the right way to treat the right patient at the right time. Um, and so there we have a potential metabolite that's found in urine that may signify a disease process and it gives us an indicator of something that will go on to look at and a potential phenotyping system within histopathology, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, you learn something new every day. So thank you if you've listened this far. Um, any comments, get me on Twitter or on YouTube or on um, Facebook at Jilly Bond Physiotherapy or at Jilly underscore Bond. Um, and I'll be back soon with more research updates as I read them. Hope you enjoyed. Bye.